Satoshi Nakamoto is the deep state. Martin North, John Adams in the interest of people. John, you're going to own the deep end. Yes, well, I mean, we're going to tackle a very sensitive subject. It could well be our last show, Martin, because <laughs> uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, people, potentially up to 20% of Australians who have invested in cryptocurrencies, and we've had uh, multiple requests. I know you've said you've had private requests. A number of people have, have raised the uh, question of, of cryptocurrencies with me over the last few years, uh, and we really haven't touched the subject. And so we're going to... Um, you know, potentially um, uh, attack the golden calf, so to speak, um, and, and talk about cryptocurrencies. And it's actually a very interesting time that we should be talking about cryptos because a lot of Australians have jumped in and, and, and while well, the market, the crypto market in, as a whole is down, I think only last year did the market capitalization reach about three trillion worldwide and we're about half of that. So, so cryptos have gone down in a slide. A lot of investors have lost money. Um, but, but, but there is, I think, a more deeper question about cryptocurrencies that I haven't really seen anyone on, at least in the Australian context, tackle. And uh, I, I think today is a very important conversation to really open our viewers' minds up to what is cryptocurrencies, where did it come from, and is there a different story that everyone may have missed? Yeah, and uh, you mentioned uh, the golden calf. You know, I said, I made a post about two years ago saying crypto is a religion. You either believe it or you don't. Yes. Right? And I got absolutely panned in my comments from people who actually are completely convinced that crypto is the future and it's not a religion, it's certainty, right? And in a way, that sort of proves the point that actually, by definition, <coughs> a religion is something you believe despite the evidence. So it'll be very interesting to see whether, in fact, our conversation today changed any opinions or not. Yes, yes. Now, now over the last few years, Martin, I've been asked about cryptocurrencies and, and people have asked me about have I, uh, per, have I personally invested in cryptocurrencies and if so, why? Like, what have I invested in and why? And the answer is uh, I haven't uh, to a large degree. I mean, some people, I do have a wallet. Some people did donate a few uh, small amounts of, of cryptocurrencies to me a few years ago. But other than that, I've not put my own money in there. And, and so, so to my mind, I think if you're going to make intelligent decisions about cryptocurrencies, I think there are three central questions or three central areas of knowledge you need to have a firm view on that I don't think a lot of investors understand. So first one is you need to understand some basic monetary economics. A and why? Because cryptocurrencies are being... Um, marketed as a uh, new form of money and you need to understand the principles of money and currency and, and how does that operate in the economic context. So you need to understand those principles and obviously as an economist I understand that element of uh, in terms of the, 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 the broad field of economics. But then you also need to understand cryptology. Um, and so one thing I've said repeatedly, for example, is, uh, so, so what, is, what is cryptology? It's basically the, the making and breaking of codes. And so, fun enough, my, my own daughter was reading a book uh, that was, she, was, she was assigned by her uh, primary school only last week where it was a whole book about cryptology. Um, very, obviously, you two very basic sort of level of knowledge, but they talked about throughout, the, throughout history how different civilizations have used codes to communicate in various ways. So, so that's what cryptology is. But... Um, one thing I have said repeatedly, when people have asked me privately, I've said, if you show me the, the, the underlying code for Bitcoin versus Ethereum versus Ripple, Litecoin, etc., um, I personally don't have the technical expertise to understand um, what, what do these codes do. I don't understand the risk reward benefit. And because I don't have that body of knowledge, um, I can't make an intelligent, uh, informed decision as to um, you know which cryptocurrency um, would be the, the would be the correct one to invest in because so because initially it was projected as or it was profited as there was one uh, uh, cryptocurrency that was going to be the alternative to the the fiat currency system which was Bitcoin and now we have more than ten thousand cryptocurrencies that are out on various exchanges around the world so you've got ten thousand choices and, and 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 to my mind you need to have some intelligent. Uh, rational basis 
to if you particularly if you're going to invest significant sums of capital as to which project to go for and 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 and, and, and perhaps not now obviously there are many people across the world who have um you know uh, it expertise they understand cryptology they they have uh, a body of knowledge that they can draw on to make those assessments but for me personally i don't so i try to stick to things that i you know understand which is obviously the warren buffett sort of thing uh you know one of his rules of, of investing invest in what you understand um but 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 then the third area that i think people need to understand is this question we're about to tackle today who is satoshi nakamoto because the the way this was rolled out is that we had the global financial crisis in 2008 and then in 2009 some somehow somewhere some person called satoshi nakamoto and it came out with a invention. Um, and obviously there was only a select number of people, um, particularly in, 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 like in the internet universe, who became aware of this and were early adopters of it. Um, but then it's now taken a life of its own and it's now grown to such an extent that one in five Australians have invested in cryptocurrencies. And now ASIC um, and the federal parliament are looking at um, regulating cryptocurrencies to be a financial product so it's actually um, part of the formal regulatory system in terms of australia uh, because people the regulators realize that a lot of there's a lot of risk here for retail investors um and they want to have more oversight so so yeah from around one person in 2009 it's now come to a fully fledged um centerpiece of the, of the financial system and, and the question is well who 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 was this person and, and how did this come about and what was their intention? Um, and, I, and, and to be honest, I think in these three areas of knowledge uh, or these, the, these areas where investors should be uh, um, asking questions, a lot of crypto investors, uh, our viewers and others are not asking these questions and a lot of people are just following the herd, i.e. the golden calf sort of scenario. And um, obviously when we see manias, whether it was internet stocks back in the late 90s or the tulip mania or, or other manias in history um some people can can benefit if you're early enough um and and, and i know uh, someone who i only had uh, a lunch with a few weeks ago who's made more than a million dollars from cryptocurrencies by timing the market correctly but then obviously if you've come in late into the market particularly if you've come in the last say six to nine months you've actually lost a lot of money uh, which is the counterfactual yeah, and it's just worth saying, I think, John, that um, you know, there's a difference between Bitcoin and the blockchain, the blockchain perhaps being the rails on which this runs and Bitcoin being an example, probably a major example. Um, so it, it's important to understand that the manifestations that we're seeing today are different flavours of things. So not all, you know, not all the, all the cryptos are behaving the same way, uh, driven off the same philosophy but there is this fundamental blockchain which is the idea of decentralized devolved no centralized control right which is one of the things which attracts many people to this way of thinking right so you've got central banks and central banks controlling fiat currency but these are completely devolved and decentralized and therefore they're somehow different and therefore that's good right now as we'll come on to in a bit later well maybe there's some questions we should ask about that right and the other point you, you say is really interesting, right? Because it did sort of suddenly pop out the woodwork. But there was a lot of work going on in parallel because I was involved in banking back then. And I remember in 1995 working with uh, people inside the organisation that I was part of. And we were trying to work out what the future of digital money would be. And in fact, we spoke about things like digital wallets and we spoke about the idea of representing um, currency in digital form back then. So there were things happening in various parts you know around the world particularly within the finance sector and beyond um i have to say that the bitcoin um wave that came later came a bit of left field and my own position is i do have a bit of bitcoin i've got bought it early because i wanted to understand it and actually getting involved with it is the only way to understand it so it's quite useful to do but anyway let's go and do a deep dive now on this well, this name, is it a person, is it not a person, is it a thing, is it a concept, what is it? Yes, yeah. well, okay, so, 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 so last year in 2021, I actually did a couple of um, economic seminars. I did one in Adelaide and I did one in Newcastle. So this was before the lockdown. Um, and I asked people, how many people in the audience? And, and so, so there was about 
I think in Adelaide, about 140 people in Newcastle, about 80, 90 people. And I said, how many people are crypto investors? And about a third to a half of the audience put their hand up. And then I just asked them one question. How many of you know that the National Security Agency, which is, which is, a, uh, which is the, the main intelligence arm of the American government, wrote a, a white paper in 1996 about cryptocurrencies? And in both situations, only one person put their hand up. So out of about 160 people, uh, who said they were crypto investors? Maybe only two people put their hand up and said we, we are aware that 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 the NSA has had a long-standing position in this. Now, um, how do I know this? So, so let's actually put slide one up on the screen. So in 1996, there was a white paper uh, published by the National Security Agency Office of Information Security Research and Technology, the Cryptology Division, and it was called "How to Make a Mint: The Cryptology of Anonymous Electronic Cash." Um, an anonymous electronic cash sounds, to my mind, and forgive me if I'm ignorant, Martin, but it sounds very similar to uh, decentralized currency like Bitcoin. Well, certainly, anonymized is, is, is right, and decentralized. Those are the sorts of the characteristics that you might expect to see. So, there is definitely a commonality here. Indeed. N now, what I would encourage the audience, Martin, is, is that people can go online and actually look up this white paper. So, so, so I mean, it, it is available online. And, and I just to make sure that, so I've known about this white paper for a while, but even as early as late as today, I just want to make sure that, that we can be confident that this is a real white paper and this is not a hoax. But so, so I did find a link where this paper has been cited over 300 times um, uh, by various academics. So, so, so yeah, so serious people within the American NSA uh, wrote about this in the mid 90s. Now, one of the, the things when you actually go through the white paper, one of the sort of things that was very interesting is a lot of the modern day concepts around cryptocurrencies were completely flushed out and spelled out in this white paper back in 1996, including uh, electronic coins and tokens, uh, public uh, key cryptology, um, wallets, secu and secure hashing. So, 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 so things that people think that were developed perhaps in the last decade as this evolution has happened. No, a lot of this stuff was fleshed out by the American government back in the 1990s. Um, and that is obviously, I think, for the overwhelming majority of Amer Australian crypto investors, perhaps a revelation that they were not fully aware of. Because I think once you accept this premise that not only was the banking system back in the 90s thinking about these concepts, but, but the intelligence arms of some of the biggest governments in the world were developing this whole um, uh, area of, 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 uh, in terms of technology. Well, what, are the, what, you know, what is the intention of this research um, and, 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 you know, what are the implications? Mm. And of course, it really does go against the grain for those people who believe that the crypto community, you know, emerged left of field, you know, from private sources and completely outside government control, right? Because this basically throws a little bomb in the whole of the story, doesn't it? Indeed, indeed. <laughs> now, now, look, funny enough, so this was a white paper in 1996. Now, in 1997, um, Hollywood came out with a movie um, uh, about um, uh, which involved the NSA and cryptology, uh, and, and that's called Goodwill Hunting with uh, uh, Robert Williams and, and, and Matt, Matt Damon. So, so now uh, we, we have a short clip that we can't play in the show for copyright, but we're going to put a link um, to, the, uh, to, to the clip where Matt Damon is talking to the National Security Agency. But, but basically, um, you know, what, what, what was portrayed in the movie was that the NSA were looking for the most intelligent uh, and sophisticated mathematicians in America to assist them in, 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 in sort of, you know, doing code breaking, developing new codes um, and, and really pushing um, technology and research to in terms of the cutting edge. Uh, and, and that's obviously one of the things that in the clip that they actually talk about, that most of the cutting edge research and technology in the United States had been classified. And if, you, if you're a smart mathematician, you want to work on some of the coolest things in the world, the only way to do it is to join the NSA. So, so, so again, so that was a very timely sort of interesting, um, uh, I will say coincidence in this, in this instance, Martin, <laughs> that we have the NSA researching cryptocurrencies in rural life, and then Hollywood is talking about um, uh, a working class bricklayer who's a super genius mathematician um, being approached by the NSA to join the American government and assist in the development of cryptology. Yeah, absolutely. Although actually his um, perspective uh, was 
I think quite interesting is he was not totally convinced by what they were doing in the first place, right? Precisely. <laughs> Precisely. Now, I mean, so, so obviously there's a lot of uh, Australians who would be aware of uh, in terms of the CIA, which is the basically the, the, the spy arm of the American government and, and of the Australian government, and all governments have, have their own agency around uh, around international spying, but a lot of maybe some Australians wouldn't be familiar with what the NSA does. Now, um, one thing that, that it's an interesting um, sort of notion that Matt Damon says in this clip is that 80% of the intelligence work done by the American government is actually the NSA, not the CIA, and they're about seven times as large as the CIA. But um, uh, some would be aware that uh, back in 2013, Edward Snowden. Um, uh, uh, basically uh, fled to Hong Kong um, and blew the whistle on the NSA. So he was he was uh, an employee of the NSA and he actually worked in the CIA and then he went to private industry and became a contractor. And then and then as a contractor, he basically um, uh, blew the whistle but uh, but escaped the United States fearing uh, le legal consequences. And now he's actually uh, living in Russia um, under asylum provided by President Putin. Um, but 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 he actually had some very uh, poignant messages about uh, in terms of the NSA. Now his revelations about the NSA were not related to cryptocurrencies, but it was in relation to a, uh, one of the programs called Prism, which was the bulk collection of of data, you know, used by collecting from phones, um, appliances that have chip, that have surveillance chips in them from computers, etc. And that bulk surveillance is collected by the American government, and then they can. Uh, use that for intelligence purposes. So, so again, uh, w it would be nice to play the clip with Edwin Snowden talking about this, but we can't for copyright reasons. But I do have a quote. So, it, so, so, so here's what he, Edward Snowden, told the Guardian newspaper in 2013. Quote: The NSA specifically targets the communication of everyone. It ingests them by default. It collects them in a system. It filters them. It analyzes them. It measures them. It stores them for periods of time simply because it is the easiest and more, and more efficient and most valuable way to achieve those ends. Any analyst at any time can target anyone, any selector, anywhere. Now, obviously, Mr. Snowden is talking about um, other programs in terms of the NSA, but, but, but there's obviously, I think, one question as to, uh, well, uh, we know, for example, that the FBI have been able to uh, target certain, certain criminal groups. I mean, uh, the one thing is, is that one of the claims about Bitcoin is, is that it, it sort of protects people's identity. But the, th the thing is, because certain things are done on the blockchain, there is actually a record of certain transactions. And I know, uh, because this is being broadcasted on American mainstream television, the FBI have solved certain crimes uh, because they've been able to piece together um, financial flows because of because of things that have happened with various cryptocurrencies in terms of the blockchain. So so again, so um, there is a question as to well, uh, did the evolution of crypto research at the NSA was it because they were trying to um, uh, provide a new form of of information tracking um, via the blockchain? Because uh, because obviously all transactions are on the blockchain, and obviously if they if they've got sophisticated techniques to uncover who is doing what on the blockchain well then they actually have um, a better tracking system than what we had in the analog banking system prior mm, yeah and it's interesting because um snowden was actually at one stage employed by booz allen and hamilton one of the big consulting firms and funnily enough i used to work for them years ago uh, there you go yeah so it's a small world isn't it um but there is there is obviously um you know a lot a lot of really interesting questions here because you know, if I go back to my think, the conversations in the in, in the late nineties, the confluence of digitalization, digital identity, payment systems, management and control, were all very much swashing around in the same bucket. Right? And what's interesting is that a lot of the things that subsequently developed from that, be it um, the Bitcoin and be it some of the other things, it's all playing in that same space. Right? So it, it's a bit like a series of, of, of fractals that you, <coughs> you, you put together. Um, and you can begin to see how together this could create quite a different future from the way that things were back then. Yes. And I actually have argued consistently since then that we've on, we're on this slippery slope 
to a future that people don't really understand. Right? But it's all based around this digitalization. So um, let's pick the conversation up then, John, because obviously one of the interesting questions is who is this character, right? The one who is associated with Bitcoin and blockchain way back in the 90s. What do we know? Well, I mean, so, so here's the interesting thing now. Um, uh, I'm not sure if anyone can draw any conclusion from this, but let's actually put up a you know, provocative tweet uh, where, where someone has actually tried to uh, use Japanese translation to figure out, well, what is, who is Satoshi Nakamoto? Now, um, it's, you know, some people are obviously saying that Satoshi is, is the equivalent word for intelligence and Nakamoto is one who lives in the middle, combining that it's central intelligence. Now, obviously, the CIA is different from the NSA. They are separate agencies, but it points to a particular type of source as to who this may be. Now, the only thing I will say about this particular tweet, Martin, is, is that I have, in preparation for this show, actually gone to a website that does a Japanese translations, and I've actually typed in Satoshi and typed in Nakamoto, and it does actually point in in terms of this direction so 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 again so I, I, i'm not by no means i did some elementary japanese in year seven year eight uh, when i was in high school so i'm not a expert and no doubt there'll be you know people who are, are affluent in japanese who may say we have it wrong so all i can say is someone put out a provocative tweet so satoshi nakamoto actually means something uh, quite significant uh, when you translate it from japanese to english uh, I've used various websites uh, uh, that, that actually assist in that translation, and these words can, you know, I mean, they are sort of uh, the interpretation seems to be correct. But if anyone thinks that that it's not correct, um, you know, feel free to put comments in, uh, you know, put comments in response to the show. But 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 yeah, but but I will say that um, while this is slightly speculative, the the fact that the NSA did write a white paper uh, and that can be you know, somewhat confirmed independently. I, I, I mean, I mean, I think these uh, these sort of concepts are quite central, because if you ask the average Australian, why did you buy? Why have you invested in crypto, uh, cryptocurrencies? A lot of it is because uh, I see other people making money, and mm. I want to make some money as well. Yeah, well, it's the herd instinct, isn't it? It's, it's the religion. It's the belief that um, there's money to be made, and of course, if you went in early. You know, you're still up. Yes. But as you said earlier on, if you went in later in the last year or so, the chances are you probably lost money. Exactly. And in s some cases, if you look at the volume of transactions, which has been quite strong, there are probably quite a few people who have lost money. It's also worth highlighting that there are a, a small number of so-called whales, so they're the ones who went in very <coughs> early and big. And, of course, every time it goes really a long way down, they just pile in and buy some more because they think it's going to go up again. But it is, it's the lemmings, it's the herd instinct, isn't it? Indeed, indeed. Now, now uh, just to, I guess, uh, again, be slightly provocative for our audiences, uh, assume this is correct. Assume that um, that the American government is Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, what would be the motivation for a government or multiple governments to create this technology and to create this herd phenomena? Um, now, I have some hypothesis as to why that may happen um and, and so we're going to go through them and we'll, we'll obviously just get your response to them so so the first hypothesis i think is um there's a whole host of concepts that cryptocurrencies um uh, entails and uh by rolling it out in the way that it, it has been rolled out and allowing a lot of people to make money particularly the early adopters um, you have normalized a whole host of concepts and gotten people used to this whole, <coughs> in terms of this whole way of, 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 of investing, but also in terms of doing, doing commerce, in terms of uh, border transactions, etc. Now, on the horizon, we have the concern about central bank digital currencies, which I'm planning to do a show with you soon about this because I actually wrote a detailed essay on my website last year about this. But... Um, uh, if there is a concern that central bank digital currencies is going to result in a loss of economic freedom because it gives the central bank, uh, but also the government of the day, much more control about the lives of citizens, uh, I, I, th I think an important concept to say, Martin, is, is that had they rolled this out, say, 10, 15 years ago, 
it would have been a, a, a tough stretch to, to, to get people to buy into the concept. But I think by people getting used to and familiar with cryptocurrencies, there's a, there's a large chunk of Australians who now think this is um, a natural evolution and they are used to, uh, they're not as skeptical uh, in terms of where, where central bank digital currencies can go. So, so again, so, so I think if you accept that premise, cryptocurrencies may be a technique of psychological warfare to, to normalize a destination that in, 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 previous de in previous decades, society would not have wanted to go down to, but people have been sort of brought along the journey using a diversionary tactic. So, so, so that's one, one, one type and of... And just on that, um, we did some consumer research. This is, again, late 90s. And at that stage, there was a huge amount of scepticism among ordinary people about the idea of digitalization of money, right? People really weren't up for it. That's changed dramatically now. Crypto has definitely been the, the, the linchpin for that. But also, if you look at all of the papers that have come out from central banks in the last 18 months to two years, the basic argument they make is that you can't trust cryptos because it's decentralized, deregulated, blah, blah, blah. But you can trust central bank digital currency. So what they're doing basically is imposing the traditional way of thinking about banking and control into the digital you know, um, regime. And I think you're right. Without the journey through crypto, they probably couldn't have taken that step. Yeah. Okay. So just to clarify, the, uh, clarify, clarify for the audience, mm. uh, when were people skeptical about digital money? So we did surveys <coughs> in the, um, the 1995, 1996, 1997. Ah. So so at the time that the NSA were writing white papers about Correct. it, people were skeptical Correct. about uh, leaving the analog system. Correct. Yes. I see. Yeah. There was there was absolutely. It was surprising because we, we, we sort of had the, the, the hypothesis at the time that if you made it easy for people, you know, and, and phone technology was evolving quite fast and other things, um, there was a, a business case to do it from a cost-saving perspective. But no, consumers were not anywhere close. Aha, uh -huh. there we go. So, 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 so that's one possible reason for, for in terms of cryptos. Now, uh, the second reason that I think cryptos may have been rolled out um, yeah, by various governments is because in response to the global financial crisis, we saw um, untold trillions of dollars being printed um, in order to save the financial system. Now, um, in traditional economics, uh, pre-GFC, a lot of that money would have went into commodities and we would have seen um, uh, you know, gold and silver and a whole host of other assets rise in price with rising inflation. And that would have sort of you know had runaway inflation. So the stagflation we're seeing now, uh, you know, a lot of people were concerned once they started quantitative easing that that was going to manifest itself straight away. But 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 what has cryptocurrencies done is with all this additional fiat currency that's been printed and pushed um, into the financial system, well, rather than going into real assets, what it's actually done is actually provided a diversionary asset class. So, so, so at its peak last year, it was three trillion dollars. So, if that three trillion dollars had gone into real assets, um, commodity-based inflation would have would have happened a lot sooner. Um, and obviously, obviously, I mean, that's what governments want to avoid. If you're going to print money, the last thing you want is consumer price inflation to go sky high because that's when your ordinary citizens get upset, and that's when you get voted out. So, cryptocurrencies has, to some degree, played. A role in sucking up these additional dollars that's been printed in the system, um, and that's actually assisted uh, Western governments, in particular, to prolong the life of the current uh, global monetary system, which is based on the US dollar. Mm. And when you said two to three trillion, right? So it's not like it's a big number. In, no. In the overall scheme of things, if you think of the amount of trillions that have been created, but nevertheless, you're right. There is potentially a, a, a little bit of a play there. Yes. Um, and, 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 and so, and so, so the last element is, is that um, cryptocurrencies have, to some degree, and again, I'm not a technical expert on this, but it, it has assisted governments to have a better feel for what is happening in terms of in terms of financial flows. Now, obviously, you know, the the most effective way of of how to be anonymous is through. Uh, uh, in terms of physical cash or in terms of uh, precious metals, because basically what that involves is 
um, me giving a, phys a physical uh, form of money or currency to you and no one has to know about it. And so once you put things on, um, uh, into, even if it's a decentralized platform, uh, like I said before, you know, law enforcement agencies have been able to solve certain crimes because people are using this new technology um, um, and money is going across border and, and a whole host of various ways. So, so that has actually provided some uh, value for intelligence gathering in terms of law enforcement. And um, can I say, I think um, in, in the case of Assange, so Assange with the, through WikiLeaks was able to reveal a whole host of uh, programs that the intelligence services were using to, to in terms of gathering data. But also th there was um, a particular program run by the CIA of how to um, uh, crack into in terms of electronic devices. So even though you think you may have the best security, um, um, whether it's a, a certain phone or a certain computer or a certain um, uh, digital platform, um, there are backdoor access keys. There are ways to get into things. And uh, what the um, Assange had revealed, and I think this is one of the reasons why he's been locked up for so many years, is that he revealed that uh, intelligence services actually have those access ability. So, so if everything's gone onto uh, the blockchain, if everything is, if you can actually access your digital currencies through an app on your phone, and you and you've been told by the manufacturer or the provider that this is secure, it's encrypted, no one can crack into it. Well, if there are backdoor uh, ways to get into that data, and, and and intelligence agencies actually have that access and you don't know about it, well, by moving from the analog system, the or the physical system, cash and precious metals, to an electronic system, well, they basically have, you know, without, without too much coercion, have actually uh, allowed you to move into a surveillance state that you probably didn't realize was, that, that it is actually happening in real time. Yeah, absolutely, and the surveillance state is something which um, I think people need to take much more seriously than they do. And again, it goes back to what I said about the um, digital ecosystem and the way that that was thought about in the late 90s. A lot of that was putting all of these eggs together. Um, and, and the reason it was done was to facilitate more direct marketing, more tailored marketing, more targeting, more information. Information's power. Information is also worth a lot. So there's a commercial interest, but there's also a government interest, isn't there, in terms of actually knowing more about more. Yes, yes. Now, I mean, like, so, so there'll be a lot of our viewers who are going to basically say that I'm ignorant and ill-informed um, <laughs> and that there is much more to crypto. Uh, and, and to be honest, even even the last fortnight, I've received private communications about cryptocurrencies and people have said, I've spent hundreds of hours researching this. You don't know anything about this, John Adams, and uh, you, you need to stick to, you need to stick into your lane. But, <laughs> but, but, but one of the things I would say, Martin, is, in terms of a couple of reasons why I think people should be sceptical uh, about cryptocurrencies. The first one is, is that just from an economic uh, value point, it actually doesn't actually achieve what it says it was supposed to achieve. So, mm. so initially, it was, it was, this was supposed to be a store of value, um, an, an alternative form of money, digital gold, etc. cetera. Um, now, um, obviously, the criticism of fiat currencies is that central banks create so much of it, it devalues and you have inflation and people lose uh, in, in, in terms of their value. Now, uh, the one point I'll make is, is that while Bitcoin has 21 million coins and it is somewhat limited, if you look at the cryptocurrency space, from, from one project, which was Bitcoin, we have now more than 10,000 out there. And, and so to my mind, is um, um, cryptocurrencies as a sector is operating in a very similar way to fiat currency. So, but, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, basically, you just can create more and more altcoins, uh, whether they have value or not. Um, and, and rather than actually being a store of value, you know, you're basically just creating more and more alternatives, which over time as a sector is, 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 is losing its uh, fundamental uh, premise and value. Well, two points. The first is that there's a lot of investment bankers who are now herding in to crypto land, right? Partly because some of their clients want access to crypto, so the investment bankers are there. But secondly, they've created a whole series of derivatives. So you can actually take positions without actually holding a Bitcoin directly. And in fact, 
some of the most interesting developments have been the derivatives, but that's precisely the same thing that's happened in gold and silver and other asset classes too. So in a way, the concept that, that, that you know, Bitcoin and blockchain is somehow completely discrete, different from the rest of the finance system is now not true. Yes. In fact, a lot of the big players are the same players operating in other sectors too. And again, a lot of people don't want to hear that. A lot of people still believe that somehow the crypto sector is, you know, discrete, different, uncontrolled, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. There are lots of big players, traditional players, who've now got their arms around the crypto sector too. And the derivatives are a huge part of it. Yes, yes. Um, so, yes, yeah, so concepts like stable coins and ETFs, I mean, look, yes, uh, uh, options, futures, all of these things have now made their way into the crypto space. Um, and, and while they are add-ons to the initial premise. I mean, the initial premise is starting to lose value. I mean, e even Bitcoin itself, I mean, in terms of its volatility, in terms of, uh, you know, some of the issues involved with it. Uh, I mean, there are advocates of, of the traditional monetary system who just says, uh, and, and, you know, e even in the last uh, week, Ben Bernanke, the former chairman of the US Federal Reserve, did an interview on CNBC yep. and basically said that, you know, Bitcoin in itself, let alone the whole crypto sector, doesn't satisfy all of its initial claims. So, so that's probably one reason why people should be skeptical. The second reason is, is, is sort of what we touched on is that, um, uh, I mean, and, and again, so, so now when you're in the middle, midst of a bubble in a mania, uh, the, the people in the herd can only believe that there's only one direction for where cryptocurrencies will go, and, and, and that is up. And obviously, you and I, since 2018, have been warning about this mainly in terms of property, that everyone believes that property can go, only, can go in, in terms of one direction. And even though in our last show we said it's still, we believe it's still going to go up because of what the, what the uh, governments and central banks are doing, um, I, mean, I mean, this fallacy that it can only go up, I mean, I mean that's what led to so many uh, people in Ireland being burnt uh, uh, when, their housing, when their housing market crashed. So, so a lot of people who think that we're, it's, the crypto sector is going down, but then it's going to rebound and it's going to recover and go up. Now, it may, but, but it may not. But, but I think uh, when you're in the midst of a mania and you're just buying various cryptocurrencies because you see other people doing it and you're not actually doing a rational cost-benefit analysis, I mean, that's a very dangerous um, place to be in in terms of being a retail investor. Uh, so, and then the third thing I think people should be skeptical about is is that um, uh, one thing that I value as a libertarian conservative, if I can call myself that, Martin, is uh, having free freedom and free will to live the life that I want. Well, what has cryptocurrencies led to? It's led to governments creating more laws, and more laws mean, um, I mean, so in in in, in theory you are free to do whatever you want unless if there's a law saying you can't do something. And so we, we now have governments legislating and creating entire regulatory frameworks around cryptocurrencies, whereas before, I mean, this was the alternative to the government. This was supposed to be our, our pathway to, to, to Freeman and Nirvana. But this whole, uh, uh, this whole journey in the crypto space has actually given an excuse for governments to take more power and, 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 and create more regulation. And that, I think, is on a net basis harmful to society compared to where we were before cryptos came about. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And, uh, you know, the know your customer processes are required in Australia, for example, if you want to actually uh, register with an exchange, is um, pretty rigorous. And it's been imposed by, by government. And, uh, you know, you can expect to see more controls. And as you say, now ASIC is, is now looking seriously at how to regulate the crypto sector. And of course, there ASIC's concerned about the number of people who lost money, yes. the scams, and there are a lot of scams in crypto, uh, you know, in the crypto universe. Uh, and uh, so there is a need from their perspective to intervene. But of course, as you say, that means that you're cutting across current freedoms. Where does it stop? Precisely. And, 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 and when you just said that, Martin, it, it, it leads into our next topic, which is in terms of the cashless society. Now, you and I in 2019 took on the Morrison government to, 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 do, to defeat their proposed legislation to criminalise the use of cash, which was above $10,000, and we were successful in that effort. But, but here we are. So if we can just put this on the screen, uh, Channel 9 actually had a story back in March of this year uh, 
suggesting there's a report out there saying that Australia will, will evolve into the cashless society in basically two and a half years in, by 2025. And, and there was a particular quote in there that I thought was relevant. It says, quote, the report also predicted that within two years, digital wallets, such as apps that allow customers to use their smartphone or smart device to pay, will overtake credit and debit cards to become the leading e-commerce payment method by 2024. So, so, so again, so what I think is... Um, you know, cryptocurrencies and this whole evolution of technology is has, has facilitated the the bringing about of the cashless society. Now, I'm not here to necessarily say you know praise or, or criticize David Icke, but one thing I'll say about David Icke, and, and obviously he's a fellow countryman of, of like in terms of yourself. <laughs> ever since the early 2000s, he has said there is a global agenda towards the cashless society, um, and, and I think it's quite. Uh, dangerous that we are here because obviously you and I vigorously argued the benefits of, of physical cash and, and the need for physical cash to remain part of the um, uh, the, the, the financial system um, and, and, and it seems to me that even though we defeated Parliament from criminalising cash there is still a movement towards um, the cashless society by banks and, and, and the whole crypto genre has normalize some of these concepts around around digital currencies that that has allowed has i think made more people complacent and less people skeptical about uh what is the intention of the elite to take us towards the cashless cashless society well that's right and it's worth i think highlighting john that it isn't just crypto that's doing that but banks obviously want to reduce costs and ha frankly handling real cash costs a lot of money um, you know, whether it's an ATM or a branch and moving the money around. So if they can avoid that, they can save money. Also, of course, if you actually have a digital transaction, it means it leaves a footprint. So you can actually, you know what people bought. And that means that you can actually then um, know more about their behaviours and habits. Now, as I said earlier on, that data is worth a lot. The banks actually use that for their own purposes. But uh, you could argue that other organisations and maybe even some financial organisations too sell that data on and actually monetize it because it gives them a profiling of you as, a, as an individual. So they don't get that with cash. Y yes, and, and, and obviously the, in, 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 when it comes to China, I mean, the, the more dangerous extreme totalitarian uh, evolution of this whole phenomena is uh, in terms of uh, having a social credit score. So basically if you behave in a way that the government says they want you to behave, you can... You, know, you can do what you want, like, for example, buy a cup of coffee or go on public transport or, uh, you know, visit a museum. But once you start to do things that the government doesn't want you to do, well, they, have the, they actually have the uh, technology in the platform to either freeze your account or to uh, prevent you from transacting with, with, in terms of certain people. Um, and, and, and that's obviously a very, you know, particularly in terms of Australia and our history as a as a sort of liberal democracy, uh, that sort of control by government is is is, is obviously very concerning. And, and I have to say, even in the context of the, of the last twelve months, we had QR codes, uh, which was uh, promoted to the public as um, a measure to assist in um, uh, health policy, and yet people. Had, who had nothing to do with health policy, uh, such as uh, various police departments across the country, used that data to, 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 to track down certain people that they wanted, whereas we were promised this was only about health and nothing other than health. And we, we found out subsequently that Queensland and West Australia in particular you know, broke that public promise and then used this data to do other things with it, which, which people did not give consent to. Absolutely, and I'll just make the point quickly. We'll cover central bank digital currency another time in more detail. But if you are given a central bank digital currency uh, account at the Reserve Bank, say, and they deliver that to your digital wallet, right, they can actually determine then what you can spend the money on, right? It's part of the whole process. So again, the digitalization and the linkage back to central bank digital currencies and to control and to surveillance, it's all a continuum. And I get very frustrated when people don't see how those dots can be joined. Yes. Now, you know, will government join the dots or will they prefer not to? Well, history tells you that if there's an opportunity to do more and surveil more and control more, governments have the tendency to go down that route. Well, well, well we at least know that in the case of China, the Chinese government have, have joined those dots. 
So, so, so that's not speculation. That, mm. is, that is a fact. But, 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 but one thing that I think is, is quite sort of uh, worrying about this whole trend is, is actually even what happened in Moscow last year. So let's actually put this last slide up there. So this is from, I think, the Guardian newspaper in October 2021, where the Moscow Metro basically rolled out facial recognition pay system. So, so rather than using, so we have in Australia Tap and Go, which is a digital system yep. where they basically say just work to the, walk to the terminal and there'll be someone to read your face and they'll know how much money you've paid into the system and then you can just walk through the, the turnstile yep. uh, because of facial recognition. And obviously we have increasing facial recognition, recognition technology being rolled out in Australia and this is obviously, you know, quite central in China about how they determine who gets to do what where. Um, and so this evolution of not just... Um, anonymous cash or in terms of, uh, you know, them being able to track and, and control how you spend, well, then how do they identify you when you're out in, in public? Um, you know, facial recognition technology combined into the system. I mean, that, 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 that is obviously very concerning to my mind as well. I'll tell you something. Back in 1995, that was one of the things that we were looking at, right? Now, in those days, facial recognition was very, very early. But the idea potentially was, what is unique about you, right, for fingerprints or whatever it was, right? Because the idea was that if you actually held um, all the records in some centralised system, so you didn't actually need to carry money around or uh, and that, but you had a mechanism to be able to actually then move it and a confirmed identification, you could then basically um, save a hell of a lot of money and more control, more security, all those things. So this is, this is old hat, Sir John, unfortunately. Yes, yes. So, so, so in conclusion, Martin, I think our viewers, now there'll be some people who are interested in what we have to say, there'll be some people who think we've lost our minds and we have no <laughs> idea what we're talking about. And, and so, you know, obviously, you know, we'll, 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 I'm interested to see the reaction to the show and, you know, we may come back with, with further comments. But I think there's just some elementary questions that if you are a crypto investor or if you're thinking of investing in crypto, there's a few things that you just need to ask yourself before you dive into this sector. One is, What's the purpose of cryptocurrencies? Who is Satoshi Nakamoto? Um, is this legitimate technology, or, or, or have you been sucked into a, to a grander scheme that you haven't sort of come to terms with, or you haven't even thought about? Uh, and also the evolution to this fully digitized economy, even in in the certain context where we want digital IDs, um, and and all of these sort of uh, digitalization of Australia is being endorsed by the World Economic Forum and other international organizations. Um, is this a natural phenomena? Is this a natural evolution of uh, Western society? Or has this been in the works for, for decades and we're being pushed into a world that we haven't actually given consent to? Uh, because to be honest, uh, the, where this ultimately can end up, and I think a lot of Australians saw the first taste of it, uh, particularly uh, last year with, with, with some of these COVID-19 management techniques, um, it's a very ugly and dangerous world, um, and I, for one, don't want to live in a world with that, where government has that much power over what I do and how I do it. No, and in closing, you know, 1984, the book, rather than the year, was actually written at the time when there was concerns about some of those things, not, not you know, as advanced because technology was advanced, but if you read 1984 today, I think it's probably more relevant than ever. Yeah, well, p particularly in the case of uh, the Biden administration where they've developed their own Ministry of Truth. Exactly. Yeah, it makes you think, doesn't it? John, thank you very much. Very interesting conversation. As you say, we're going to upset some people, but open your minds and just think about the bigger picture here, right? How does this play out? And could it have been that some of those traps had been laid deliberately to take us to a particular outcome? Absolutely. Martin North, John Adams, and interested people. We'll see you next time.